and this is fantastic. This is I, I, some people are going to be like, "What do you mean your horse is training you? That's that's dumb. They're not supposed to be training you. You're supposed to be in charge, the leader, all of that." It's a two-way conversation in my book. I mean, training is a two-way conversation. And there's give and take, and the horse gives information, I give information, the horse gives information, and that's how we go. And I want open dialogue with my horse. I want them to communicate with me and let me know what's going on. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Willing Equine Podcast. We are recording this in my car during my commutes to and from my work, so the audio may not be super clear, and also my daughter is with me in the car, so you may hear her little comments throughout the podcast. But otherwise, hopefully you can enjoy this podcast and we can discuss all sorts of interesting topics that have to do with making a positive impact on your relationship with your horse. Hello everyone. Um, I'm really hoping that this episode isn't unbearably noisy because I'm in a different vehicle today. I'm in my the ranch truck, which uh, is not as quiet as um, my car because it's diesel and uh, just lets in more noise, like the road noise. And anyway, that's off topic. But I was wanting to talk about an interesting topic that I don't think is talked about very much. And I just said talked three times, four times now in the same sentence. Um, but what I want to do is kind of dive into an interesting idea that isn't often brought up. And that idea is, is that as much as we are training horses, you know, we like to think that we are, um, training our horses that we you know we can talk all day about how every, how every time we walk into the stall with them we're training them that every time we interact with them we're training them horses are always learning but there are actually two learners in every given situation or more but in this when we're talking about a horse human relationship the human is actually always learning Uh, You are always learning every time you interact with your horse and not just because you're learning, um, you're improving your skill level and things like that. The horse is actually teaching you. Now, they may not be consciously set out, setting out to think of, oh, I'm going to teach this human to do this X, Y, or Z thing today. You know, they don't have these training plans for us, unlike we have for them, which is kind of odd if you start going down that whole path of the fact that we have these training plans and ideas of what we want to teach these other animals. Um, And really, no other species does that to us or to each other. Um, It's kind of an unusual idea. But anyway, we can go down that mental path a different day. I don't want to go too far down the hole, the bunny rabbit hole. We could get really complicated there. Um, But horses are indeed always teaching us. They're always figuring out what they need to do in order to get us to do something that they want. Um, and then we are always learning what it is that causes the outcomes that we want. So one easy example of this is the use of punishment. So when we, let's say a horse bites us and we punish them by smacking them on the face and they stop biting. The horse received positive punishment. So that's the application of an aversive to decrease the likelihood of a behavior occurring in the future. So the horse is less likely to bite again. And we actually receive positive reinforcement for that behavior. We actually are reinforced for acting that way because we get what we want, which is the horse to stop biting. Actually, there may be some negative reinforcement that is in there too, because if a horse, let's say that a horse is just persistent and mouthy. Let's just say that in, we're going to take a similar situation. So the horse is biting, but it's a little bit different type of biting. Let's say the horse is hanging its head over the stall door and is just nipping and biting at you and pushing on you and nudging you and everything. And then you smack them and it makes it stop. You just got relief from an annoyance. So an aversive, the horse biting at you, nudging on you, pushing you around, and then you having, you performing a certain action will give you relief from the 
annoyance that you were trying to get relief from. You're trying to get this horse to stop doing this really obnoxious thing. What do I need to do to make this horse stop? Oh, this happened to work. Ah, relief. So you're actually learning through every one of your interactions with your horse what works and what doesn't. The really important part here, though, is to remember that we can consciously decide to choose our actions, to choose the way that we interact with our animals. So you can also get positive reinforcement or relief, so negative reinforcement, relief from pressure, or aversive and aversive through other ways of approaching it. So we could also get a horse to stop biting by clicking for an alternative behavior. So if you don't want your horse to bite you, you maybe, but maybe you want them to touch a target instead. You could click for touching the target. Okay, that works. The horse stopped biting, positive reinforcement for the human, fantastic job. You got what you wanted. Yay. (laughs) Um, So that's another thing that you could do to get that same type of positive reinforcement. It may not be as instantaneous though, because you have to strategically plan to shape an alternative behavior and it may take a few repetitions to quite a few repetitions to teach the horse to touch a target instead of biting you. Um, And maybe that's not the best example. I don't know that you would actually do that. Maybe in certain situations, it really depends, but hopefully you understand the idea. The idea is that there are multiple ways to receive positive reinforcement or uh, negative reinforcement. So relief from pressure and aversive that we can choose. We can consciously choose to pick different paths, pathways to success for us. So what is it that we want and how can we get there? There are multiple ways. There's many different ways of doing it, but the learner, so the horse in this situation is also learning at the same time. So how do we want them to also be experiencing the training situation? Just because we get relief from an aversive or we get positive reinforcement for stopping um, a behavior that we didn't want, just because we are getting one of those two things and it's successful to us doesn't necessarily mean that is the way that we want the horse to be experiencing the training setup. We don't necessarily want them to be feeling that way or that's how they're learning um, through this and set up so we can actually choose to change how we train so that the horse learns a different way and that we can still learn the same way. We can still find relief or get that reinforcement. Okay, so we've got the concept, the idea that we are always learning. There's other ways that we're learning as well. So a really good example of this is start buttons and start cues for horses. Uh, one, and this happened to me, I'm actually going to give you a real life example, something that kind of dawned on me the other day, um, that I didn't realize was happening, but my horse had actually trained me. Uh, she, so when I do, when we do positive reinforcement training or clicker training or however you want to refer to it, when I'm clicking and reinforcing with a food reward, there's different, there's repetitions. So a one repetition would be the horse, um, does a behavior, I click it, I give them food, then they start again by offering a pay behavior, I click, I give food, start again. So really the repetition happens, you would think it was in between click and the next click, but it's actually in between when they get the food and when they get the food again. So that's a repetition of when they receive their primary reinforcer, the food or the scratches or whatever it is, to the next one. So from one to the next, that's a repetition. You can also have the click in there as well um, as far as that can help define your repetition as well. But truly, it's from food to food uh, or scratch to to scratch to scratch. Um, So that's one repetition. Now, part of what happens during those repetitions is that the human will cue a behavior. Once a behavior is starting to be put on cue, you're supposed to cue it. The horse does it. They get a click and they get food. Then you cue again. They do the behavior, click food, you cue again. And we, you can see how that pattern goes. Well, there's actually another part that happens in there that it's often really missed, uh, in horse training when we're working with positive reinforcement, um, And even in negative reinforcement, I've noticed this as well. It's when the horse lets us know that they're ready to try again. And 
it doesn't happen a lot in negative reinforcement training, but I have noticed it happen with some trainers, but it does happen a lot with positive reinforcement. And so I'll give you a little story. So I was watching a video of me working with my Philly river and I had just really started diving into the idea of start cues and start buttons and all of that, uh, which is when the horse lets you know that they're ready to start again or to offer a behavior. And they're basically telling you, okay, I'm ready for you to give me the cue. And then you give the cue and then they offer the behavior and then you click and then you reward and then it starts all over again. Well, I was watching a video of me working with one of my horses and I was contemplating what type of start button I'd like to train the horse to have so they can let me know that they're ready to go again. And when I was watching this video, I was like, ah, there, there is already one. The, the horse is already, without me even knowing it, subconsciously, I have no idea how this happened. I, I, I didn't even recognize that it was happening. But I could see over and over and over again this process happening where I'd give, um, let's start with the click, so or offering the behavior. She would offer the behavior, I would click, I'd give food, she'd chew her food, and then she would turn her head slightly towards me, I would cue, she'd offer the behavior, I'd click, I'd give the food, she would chew the food, then she would turn her head slightly towards me, I'd cue the behavior again, and so on and so forth. Do you see the pattern here? She had actually started giving me a bit of information that told me that she was ready for the next repetition. She had already created her own start button, and I had been cleverly trained by my horse to start the next repetition. When she turned her head to the side slightly towards me, I was like, oh, you're ready. And I gave the cue and the behavior, and anyways, the cycle goes on and on. Um, I didn't know I didn't know this had happened. I honest <laughs> Scout's Honor <laughs> did not know that I my horse had given had created a start button and literally she's turning her head towards me to say uh, she's pushing a little start button. She's saying, "Okay, we're ready. Let's go." Um and so she had trained me. And this is fantastic. This is I, I some people are going to be like, "What do you mean your horse is training you? That's this dumb. They're not supposed to be training you. You're supposed to be in charge, the leader, all that." It's a two-way conversation in my book. I mean, training is a two-way conversation, and there's give and take, and the horse gives information, I give information, the horse gives information, and that's how we go. And I want open dialogue with my horse. I want them to communicate with me and let me know what's going on. Um, I want them to have the ability to communicate with me, and I don't ever plan on shutting that down. I don't want to suppress that communication. Uh, I think a lot of people really want that with their horses too. They want, especially people that have grown up doing like natural horsemanship or even just recently. I mean, that's a big, that's something that they're really after, which is looking for that communication. And this is the truest form of communication, in my opinion, where the horse can tell me they are ready to start again. So this is fantastic though, because now I know when she's ready and I can start again. Now I will say, I'll just throw this in there. I didn't, once I realized what was going on, I did not want the head, uh, the head turning towards me to be the start button. I, for me, it's not a big deal. I don't actually care that much that she turns her head towards me. It's not, I'm not at risk. She's not mugging me. She's not, it's not this issue. Well, I should say she's not, um, foraging on me. That would be the more, more scientifically correct, I guess, way of referring to it. Mugging is a, tends to be a little bit of a negative, it gives a negative connotation to the behavior of searching for food when it's a completely natural behavior, completely normal to the horse, and we shouldn't be so upset by it, but we do indeed want them to have safe manners around food. So we train that and that's fine. I do that too. But so I don't have much of a problem of her turning her head towards me to ask for the next repetition. But I will say that I work with a lot of students and a lot of clients that may, might find it a little bit uncomfortable. They might feel like she is invading their personal space or they might feel threatened by it and might be at risk. She might be at risk of being punished for it. And so I don't want to put her in that situation. So I have decided that I'd like to change her start button. I'm still going to give her is just as much um, control over the situation and over the environment and over the training so she can tell me when the, she's ready for the next repetition when she's ready to be cued 
but I'm going to ask her, I'm going to gently shape that to be something else. And I'm not going to go through the whole process. Um, but basically I've changed that start button to be head straight forward with ears forward. So when she's finished chewing, she can put her head wherever kind of she wants. But as soon as her head is straight forward again and her ears are forward, that's the start button to start again. Uh, and so that has worked out beautifully for her. And it's actually really helped us in a lot of areas um, as far as setting us back up for another round of whatever behavior and kind of gives us a good place to start. So it's an excellent start button for a lot of behaviors is that um, happy ears forward, head forward. Everything's nice and peaceful. Uh, you're standing quietly beside me. Okay, now let's go for another round. And so she just automatically assumes that position when she's ready to start again. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of a bunny tangent, but also a bunny trail tangent, whatever. Um, but also is to the point I'm talking about with horses training us. It's training as a two-way conversation, especially with positive reinforcement in that your horse is always giving you feedback, always giving you information on how the training's going. If you're listening, and even sometimes even if you're not listening, there are so many horses. Uh, I'll give another example. I did a consultation not long ago where um where the horse was standing at the gate pawing pacing uh just acting rather frantic about being in a stall and let me be clear that this was a very large pen really that was covered so for you know bad weather and the horse was outside all the time it was just only in there to eat meals and during really bad weather so this is not a case where the horse was going through extended periods of stress and from all the information I gathered it didn't seem like he should be as stressed appearing as he was looking when I was there except for as the longer I was there the longer I realized or the more I started to realize that this was a trained behavior so the horse had learned that if he paced back and forth and if he pawed at the gate and if he um, just in general acted rather frantic, he could get his owner to let him out. And so he was training the owner to let him out when he acted this way and the owner was training him that that worked by letting him out when he did it. So they were both training each other and it was just this terrible cycle that was continuing to escalate and it was getting more and more dangerous to the point where he had actually started to also bite and stuff anytime anybody would reach into the um, into the stall or uh, pet him on his nose or anything like that. And it wasn't an aggressive, you know, an angry or fearful bite. It was a um, more anxious behavior, more like mouthing, I guess I should say. It was more like mouthing than biting. Um, but it was a cycle that was happening where the horse was training the human and the human was training the horse. Uh, and the human didn't even realize that this was happening. Um, in, in the human's mind, the horse just acted frantic in the stall. I don't know what to do about it. Hey, quit it, horse. I don't understand why you're doing this. Um, and then also she was very aware of the fact that this was also not healthy for him to be this frantic in a stall. So she just didn't keep him... Um, confined that much and there was also other factors involved as well we suspect that there were some stomach issues and and also he had lost a companion not too long ago so there was definitely some underlying stress that was in that was happening in that situation but there was absolutely conditioning on both sides so for the human and the horse there was training happening on both sides that nobody had recognized Uh, at least the human hadn't recognized the horse probably knew (laughs) um that was happening. And so once I brought awareness to that, it was like sudden light bulb moment. Oh yes, I see. I see now the train, the horse has been training me and I've been training him and it's just been this cycle. Um, so this really, you know, this idea applies to so many different areas of horsemanship and training and working with our horses. Um, another example I can give people is when a horse is like, let's say you have a horse on cross ties and this is a pretty common boarding um, situation where you have a horse on the cross ties for grooming and you need to go get your saddle. So you go into the tack room to go get your saddle. You get slightly sidetracked or maybe not even sidetracked at all. But during that time, the horse starts pawing and you charge out of the tack room like quit it you know you're yelling at them or you slap them or even just giving them any type of attention any type of even just walking out of the tack room 
what have we just taught the horse? And what has the horse taught us? They have been taught and they are teaching us that, well, if you go into the tack room and the horse starts pawing and you come out, the horse is like, aha, if I just paw, I can make the human come out. Obviously, they're probably not thinking to that deep of a level, but it is happening. That conditioning process is happening. That, that operant conditioning process is happening where they are getting reinforced for that pawing behavior by making what they wanted to happen, happen. And for the humans, they are training the horse that that's what works, that that's what's going to make them come back out of the tack room is if they start pawing. So it's this cycle where both participants in the relationship are being actively trained at all times. And at a minor level with a less irritating behavior, um, let's say that you... um, Let's say that you want to teach your horse to move off the leg. So you could, so let's say you want to teach your horse to move off the leg. So go forward when you squeeze your leg. If you squeeze your legs and the horse is like, oh, I want to get rid of that aversive pressure. So they, they move a step forward and you release the pressure. Okay. So when you've applied the legs, the horse took a step forward, you learned that applying your leg pressure will make the horse take a step forward, so that's a win for you, and then the horse learned that if they take a step forward, it makes the human stop squeezing the legs, so they're also teaching you to take off your legs, because by, and they're teaching you to take off your your legs when they take a step forward, um, that's a little bit more of a complicated example, I hope that made sense, but you're also learning, even if you're consciously training the horse, even if you know what it is that you're doing that's making the horse or getting the horse to do certain behaviors, you're still being reinforced for that process. Even if you've been training horses for years and years and years, and you know that if you squeeze your legs hard enough, eventually they'll take a step forward and eventually you get to take your legs off. Every single repetition, every single time you do that with every single horse, that behavior is becoming more and more and more solid in your behavioral repertoire. So you are, it's becoming more solid. It's becoming more and reinforced. It's having a, um, a more extensive history of being successful. So that behavior becomes more ingrained and you just know if you squeeze, that horse will walk forward versus let's say it's maybe your very first time trying it. Maybe let's, you've never ridden a horse. Maybe you don't even have a coach. You've never had an instructor and you're just like, how do I get this horse to move forward? I kind of remember reading in a book somewhere that you squeeze your legs. So you try squeezing the legs and the horse takes a step forward and you're like, aha, it worked. That was reinforcement for you and it worked. But that was your very first successful time. And the more you do it, the more it's going to be reinforced. Now, with positive reinforcement training, with clicker training, the same process happens. When you're first learning to use positive reinforcement and clicker training, I'm just going to refer to it as clicker training from for this podcast during this time. I am a little bit touchy on using the term clicker training just because it doesn't fully encompass what I do. But... In this particular example, I'm going to be specifically talking about using a clicker, so it is, it'll be fine. Um, so if you, the horse touches the cone and you click and you're doing this because a coach told you to, somebody told you to do it and you're just like, all right, whatever person, you're crazy. Um, but the horse touches the cone, you click and you're like, I don't see how this is going to work, but you give them some food and you're like, okay. But then they go and do it again. You're like, oh, Okay. And so you click again, you give them some food. And now the horse is like, oh, you mean touch this cone? And they're like touching it and you're clicking and you're giving them food and they're touching it again. And it's just like happening over and over and over again. And every time, single time that repetition happens, every single time the horse touches the cone, you're learning that that click and that giving the food is teaching the horse. And the horse is also learning if I can touch this cone, this human will make that little noise happen, which will make me, which will make them give me the food. And so it's this mutual learning process that's always happening. Um, that's fascinating and it's fascinating to watch. And I can, I see it a lot because I teach people how to teach their horses 
uh, and how to get horses to do different things. Um, and sometimes it's challenging to teach two different learners at the same time to teach each other. But the process is extremely fascinating and teaches me a lot about how people learn and how horses learn and how they teach each other and how this cycle happens and how we're, everybody's always learning all the time. And I'm also, so if we've got this situation set up where I've got the person and the horse, so the student and the horse and me, I'm also learning. I'm learning what works to get this person, the student, to get the horse to do this certain thing. And that horse is teaching the student, which is then teaching me. And it's this three-way type conversation that, you know, mutual training triangle that's happening. And it just makes it more complex for me um, since I'm supposed to be coaching everybody, including myself. Um, But I think this process, this understanding to wrap this all up without leaving you guys completely confused. The, what's so interesting and valuable about understanding this process is if you can recognize that you are always learning, you can also break that cycle. You can also break this, you know, that mumbo jumbo cycle you know, thing that's happening, like in that situation with the horse that was being anxious at the gate to be let out. If you can stop yourself and realize that that's happening, you can change it. You can change what it is you're doing that's teaching the horse. And then the horse will then learn that something else teaches you. So you can actually change how the horse is teaching you in a way, or what it is that teaches, I'm trying to make sure I'm framing this correctly, but I think you get the idea that you can break apart the entire training relationship and pick apart the pieces. And what is the horse teaching you in any given moment while you're also teaching them? And you can make those changes. You can change that. So if you don't want the horse, um, pacing at the gate, what else could you do? How, what else could the horse do to teach you to let them out of the gate? That's what I wanted to say. All right, I got it. I'm on the right track now. What could you change so that the horse learns that something else will get you to open the gate? How can you enable the horse to teach you in a way that you want to be taught in a, and give you behaviors that you want to be the behaviors that get what they want? Um, do you want the horse to stand still? Do you want the horse to touch a target? Do you want the horse to back up? Do you want the horse to ring a bell? I mean, the, the options are endless for that particular setup, for that particular situation. I just wanted the horse to, um, I asked the student, the owner, to only open the gate when he was standing quietly, even for a fraction of a second just a fraction of a second. And now we set up the whole environment, the whole situation we had other, so that he wasn't stressed and pacing around. And it wasn't like we were waiting him out for 30 minutes while he frantically pawed at the gate. Um, we set it up so that he had some food available, that we were standing far enough away that it wasn't causing a stress, you know, it wasn't causing him to be extra anxious about it. Like he wasn't expecting to be let out. We, he also had a companion right next door, uh, right next to him. There was all kinds of things we did to make it as low stress as possible for him so that he was more likely to offer the behavior that we wanted, which was to stand still at the gate. And when he did stand still at the gate, we went and opened the gate. And so now the horse thinks, oh, in order to train the human to let me out, I need to stand still for a second. And then eventually it's going to be a couple seconds and then it's going to be a couple minutes. Um, And really we're going to make that process a little bit more elaborate as in the horse is just supposed to do anything other than pacing the gate frantically and pawing. So he could be eating his hay. He could be drinking water. He could be socializing with his companion. He could be just doing anything other than frantically pacing at the gate. So anytime he's calm and relaxed and doing other things is when he's going to be let out. And that's going to create... A new training cycle where the human realizes that the horse is training, thinks that they're training her or is training her when to open the gate. And so she's going to train the horse to be calm and relaxed. 
And the way she's going to train the horse to be calm and relaxed is to make those calm and relaxed behaviors the way that the horse trains the human to open the gate. So I hope that explains the cycle and the process and kind of gives you a look at how the two-way communication is always happening. It's always happening no matter how you train. It's always happening um, and how our horses are always teaching us as much as we're teaching them. It's just that sometimes we have to step outside of the cycle, step outside of the box and look at what is the horse teaching how is the horse teaching us and is that the way that we want them to teach us and can we make a change there so that the dialogue so that the conversation is more compatible that it's more something that we're looking for that it's more enjoyable for everybody it's lower stress for everybody and it's more positive for everybody in the relationship Thanks so much for listening. If you want to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com. Uh, on there, I have a very extensive FAQ page that offers information and answers questions about training in general, as well as my training and services and more information about The Willing Equine. I'm also available on most major platforms, uh, social media platforms, that is, such as Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. On my website, there's also a blog. I'm an extremely prolific writer. I love to write. So besides my podcast, that's another way to get access to information that I share and also feel free to leave feedback I love to hear from you guys I want to hear what you think what you like what you don't like about the podcast and any changes you might recommend Um, so if you are listening through Apple Podcasts, feel free to leave a review through there or you can contact me through my website or one of those social media platforms and I look forward to talking to you in future podcast episodes